first one in the morning, so thank you for coming. Um, the talk is Aw Ship, Attack Surface of the Maritime Industry. I'm going to talk about boats for a little bit. Um, who am I? Uh, my name is Johnny, uh, John, but Johnny Sunshine. Um, I work somewhere, they pay me some money. Uh, I don't work in the maritime industry, and, and I want to stress this point that I don't work in the maritime industry. I've never worked in the maritime industry. Um, I'm not former Navy. I have no connection at all to the maritime industry. This is all stuff that is open and online. Um, some of it I got got from talking to some people that work in the maritime industry, but they, none of it is NDA, none of it is especially secret. Um, it's all stuff you can find out. Um, so let's start by talking about super basic. How do you get stuff when you go to the store and you buy something? Where does it come from? Um, so the first thing that happens is it comes out of a factory and it gets loaded into onto a pallet and then pallets get loaded into shipping containers. Um, and the shipping container gets, uh, you know, weighed and, and inventoried uh, and the shipping contract signed and some of that's insurance and so on. Um, so the shipping contract signed with a shipping, uh, with a shipping company um, and the shipping, uh, the shipping container is put onto a truck or a train, brought out to the port. The port checks the manifest, loads it onto the ship that it's supposed to be on that's going to the right spot, uh, and then it sets sail. And it's sailing for however long it takes. Um, for instance, Shanghai to Oakland is a 21-day travel um, across the Pacific. Um, the entire time that it's on shipping, it's being tracked by the, the, the shipping company. Um, the shipping company makes sure that like everything's in order. Uh, then it lands at its destination. So, you know, in this example, we'll talk about Oakland because it's where I'm from. So it comes to Oakland, gets loaded off the off the ship onto the correct train or truck, um, and then it co gets to your destination, gets to your Walmart or whatever. So that is basically where stuff comes from. Um, let's go back in time a little bit. Maritime uh, shipping is a fundamental um, human property. We've always used ships for moving things. Um, it's a lot more efficient than moving it by land. Um, land moving things by land is energy expensive. Um, some of the earliest writings we have uh, are involved navies, um, you know, the, the ancient Greeks and what have you. Um, when you ship, ship stuff by land or whatever, you, you, your threat model here is, is highwaymen, it's people robbing your stuff. And it's not really that much different from at sea. We just have pirates as your, as your, uh, your threat model. So pirates have always kind of been part of shipping and you just kind of have to deal with them. That's where navies come from. Navies came there to deal with pirates. Um, and, and the navy, you know, protects shipping channels in the same way that, that, that the army or, or police protect land channels. Um, the concern's always been kind of someone stealing your stuff. Um, and the, the demarcation borders on land are much easier to, to figure out than on sea where they're kind of just fuzzy. So, you know, we also have navies for, for um, national security reasons. Um, so then we started adding computers to them. Um, and why might we care about some of the, some of the, the, um, information threats to, to boats is we have a few different uh, concerns. We have the ecological con concern. So running in, running a boat, running an oil tanker aground would be an ecological disaster. Um, any, you know, depending on what the cargo is, um, anything can be uh, like ecologically. We also have the national se security concern. So um, when you're moving all of this trade, uh, uh, when you're moving uh, all this stuff on the trade, it becomes sort of a national security con concern. Um, if an individual ship were to get attacked, you know, that becomes a policing issue. If you just, if anybody in the room were to go out and swim out and try and steal a boat, you know, the cops or the Coast Guard will come stop you. But if, if you start to disrupt the shipping industry, that becomes a naval concern. So um, you can starve a, uh, starve a government of resources uh, by disrupting shipping. You can, you know, do all manners of things. Um, and the other one is, is finance. So 90% of the world's trade is by ship. Um, that's $96 trillion uh, annually. Um, almost everything you get uh, comes by, there's that, um, there's that saying like if you, if you got it, a truck brought it. The same is true of ships. If you, if you got something, probably at some point in time it, it came with a ship. So what are our concerns here? So the ecological concern is literally the plot to the movie Hackers. Um, 
I, I don't really know what to, else to say about that one. Like the little boat flips over. If a hacker were to attack a boat, um, spill oil everywhere, just to arrest some punk hacker kids. Um, <clears throat> some of the uh, national security threats. So recently, um, it was 2004, I believe. Um, there was a bunch of ab uh, GPS abnormalities around the uh, around the Black Sea. So. Um, 20 ships reported uh, GPS abnormalities, and this is around the Crimea region of, of Ukraine or Russia, um, where a bunch of ships uh, suddenly thought that they were at an airport uh, 32 kilometers inland, and all of their AIS data, all of their anti-collision data that they used to coordinate with each other, um, corroborated this fact. Everybody thought that they were in an airport inland, which, you know, being on the water was definitely not the case. Um, the other one is the the recent collisions um, of uh, there were four there were four um, tanker uh, naval ship accidents that happened uh, last year. One of them was the USS John McCain. The other one was the um, USS uh, Fitzgerald. Um, the John McCain collision left uh, 17 sailors dead or missing at the water, and it was just you know a naval ship and a commercial ship collided. And if we want to talk about some of the financial threats for a little bit, um, so these are these are some numbers of how much a ship costs. So uh, this is they're slightly old numbers because the uh, the Panama Canal got expanded, but um, and these are the the one, only ones that I could dig up all the numbers for. So th this is for a Panamax ship, so the the maximum amount, uh, the maximum size ship that could fit through the old Panama Canal standard. So they cost twenty six point four million dollars to build. Um, they uh, they cost about five to seven thousand dollars a day to operate, depending on oil prices. Um, and judging uh, based based on, on on these particular numbers of they hold fi uh, five five thousand twenty foot equivalent unit uh, shipping containers, so fifty two thousand tons of cargo, um, a twenty one day voyage. It costs about fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars for uh, to to ship a shipping container. Um, works out to be about uh, Three hundred fifty thousand to seven hundred thousand dollars a day in in revenue to run these ships. So, if you were, if you could disrupt a ship um, at sea or anywhere, um, prevent it from from sailing, you're costing the company, you know, three hundred fifty like uh, top end seven hundred thousand dollars a day just for one day of, of it sitting in port rather than doing its job. Um, and they they carry millions to billions of dollars worth of cargo, like j even just an oil tanker. And like oil is a cheap commodity compared to some of the things that go on ship. Um, an oil an oil uh, tanker carries thirty five million dollars worth of oil um, across wherever it's going. So when you build a ship, um, they're built more or less to spec. So there's a few things that you need to have um, to make it seaworthy. Um, and there's a handful of, of classification societies, is what they're called, um, who will you know, take your ship, look at the manifest, do some measurements, and declare that this is, in fact, seaworthy. Um, and if you want to operate in certain ports and get flagging, you need to have this seaworthiness certificate. So if you, you, know, you build a ship, um, you talk to a classification society, you take the classification society's report, and you can go get a flag for it. So then you can start operating. Um, the, the biggest one in America is ABS. Um, and so I looked up what ABS had to say about the future of shipping. So some of the future trends that they state for container ships is uh, energy management, um, building for current and future service speeds, so like just the speed of, of movement, uh, environmental regulations. You know, we're, we care more about ecological concerns now than we did in the past, so they, they want to look at that in the future. Um, <clears throat> gas as fuel rather than using diesel for whatever reason, um, and the behavior of the steel structure. So these are the things that they, they, they're talking about. Is like these are the future trends of container ships. These are the things that future shipbuilders are going to have to focus on. And I want to point out that the one thing that is missing there is anything at all to do with electronic security, cybersecurity, whatever you want to call it. Um, they're, they're not concerned about it at all. So if you're a shipbuilder looking to build like a future-proof boat, what are you going to do? You're going to make it run on gas, make it fuel efficient, um, use decent steel. You aren't going to care about its cybersecurity, because why would you? These are the people, your, your customers just want a uh, boat that they can get flagged. This is what they want. So 
let's talk about some of the systems that we have uh, on board a ship and in the shipping industry in general. So I'm going to start with the, the harbor. So a harbor is it's a big ICS system with some offices on board and so on. So the ICS systems, I mean, it's all SCADA or SCADA. Um, they're you know fa fairly standard pieces of equipment that you can use. Um, they're not known for their security. There have been dozens of ICS talks by now. They have ICS villages at almost every con. Um, you know, these ICS systems are vulnerable in ways that uh, other people are more uh, qualified to talk about than I am. But the the TLDR of it is that they're not especially secure systems. Um, they also have offices um, or IT systems, and and again, like the, these are harbors. They're not tech companies. Um, IT and IT security is not their primary concern. Um, it's not their core competency. Um, they also have uh, a number of, of vessel traffic systems uh, things. So AIS repeaters is one of them. So AIS is an anti-collision radio system that they use. Um, uh, it's a fairly simple protocol. Um, other things in, in, in VTS, uh, radar, what have you. Um, Basically, VTS is, is like air traffic control, but for boats. It's used for, for tight waters, um, such as around a harbor. Um, all boats have navigation systems, uh, the most primitive of which is ELORAN. Uh, and ELORAN is just a, like, it's a radio triangulation um, protocol. Um, all these boats have, have chart data um, that they download, so just you know, arbitrary blobs of data that they'll run. Um, they all use GPS and friends for modern navigation. Um, GNSS is the, the, the broad term for it. Um, it includes like the, the European standard and the Russian standard. Um, and LRIT is a long range uh, vessel tracking system that was added after uh, September 11th um, to track vessels, make sure that they're going where they're supposed to be, they don't get diverted, terrorists haven't taken them over, or what have you. Um, and they all use satellite communication. So, you know, if you need to call the captain on a ship, um, the only way they can really get a hold of you is, is satellite communications. Um, and the satellite communications uh, are, again, not as, they're, they're particularly vulnerable uh, systems. So I want to point out a couple CVEs that I dug up on one of the satellite communication systems for the, uh, PD, the uh, pilot below deck equipment um, for the Iridium terminals. So the first one, is CVE 2014-0326. So the pilot below deck equipment and open port implementations on Iridium satellite terminals allow remote attackers to read hard-coded credentials via the web interface. So cool, we're in, we got web interface. What can we do with that? CVE 2014-0326. The terminal upgrade tool in the pilot below deck equipment and open port implementations on Iridium satellite terminals allows remote attackers to execute arbitrary code by uploading new firmware to TCP port 54321. So not only do we have a login that was hard-coded, we also can just upload whatever the hell we want onto it. So it, and these are from 2014, they're not especially old. So these are Iridium satellite terminals that you can just log into, run arbitrary code, and use that to jump to any other system you want. Like, these are not, not especially well um, segregated systems here. Uh, on the ship itself, they also use ICS systems. They got diesel pumps, they have cranes, they have um, all, I mean, motors, things. They do things. They're, moving factories. Um, they have uh, crew entertainment systems. So when you work on a ship for 21 days, you know, you have off time, you're going to get bored, you're going to watch a movie or something. Um, and they have systems on board for that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the movies that they're going to get are going to be on USB sticks that they picked up at some random street vendor in Shanghai. Um, plug them right into their laptops. Um, they have navigation computers on board, the uh, EDCIS, the Electronic Display and Chart Information Systems. So these, these are computers with displays. Um, they run code. They're vulnerable. They're plugged into other things so that they can get more data. Um, they're plugged into the nav systems. Um, they're plugged into the, uh, the uh, um, piloted, piloted systems and so on. Um, they uh, the boats will also have um, like distress systems, so in case anything happens, they have uh, digital selective calling, um, 
the maritime distress systems, so man overboard systems, uh, et cetera. Um, they're all radio systems. Some of them will speak satellite. Um, they're connected to other things so that they can figure it out. Um, they have vessel, uh, the vessel monitoring system is a, a uh, fishing uh, thing. Um, it, it lets ships uh, report catches, um, where their ship, where where they're uh, where they're fishing. There's a radi uh, radar component to it, um, and you know they've got AIS transponders and LRIT. So AIS is for for short range um, anti collision. It's uh, again it's a it's a radio protocol. Um, they have uh, LRIT, which again is the post 9/11 vessel monitoring or sorry uh, vessel tracking system. Um, and you know a lot of these systems are just connected with NMEA, which is basically CAN bus. And again, if you've talked, if you if you've ever been to any of the car hacking talks or been to the car hacking village, like NMEA, CAN bus uh, are again, they're they're trivial protocols that you can if you can connect to them somehow, you can just bang bits down the wire. Um, you can make ships do things, which um, which you know like you think there'd be some kind of security for. Um, so AIS. Uh, this is a marine traffic website that you can look at around the Port of Oakland, and AIS allows you to watch where all the ships are. Um, so you can see every ship that's in and out of the Port of Oakland on whatever day this is, April, sometime in April. Um, and not only that, it, it allows you to dig down some information. So this is the MOL beacon en route from LAX to Oakland uh, on whatever day that was in, in April. Um, and if, if you were looking to, to track down a ship, uh, AIS is not a bad way to do it. Um, but ships will turn it off. Uh, if, they're doing, if, if they don't need it um, or they would like to, be, like to move quietly, they do have the option to turn it off. LRIT is, is not the case. Um, that one is always on. And AIS is, a, is such a simple radio protocol. Um, that doesn't do any attestation that this that this signal is coming from where where it's supposed to. That it's trivial to spoof. Um, this was at a, an event that I went to a couple years ago, uh, where we had a whole bunch of ghost boats spelling out the word "pwn," um, and we actually caused the anti-collision autopilot to steer away from our artificial boats. So we basically moved the boat where we wanted it to just by inserting fake boats over the radio waves. Um, LRIT uh, is new. Uh, LRIT was standardized in 2006. Um, it's an XML-based protocol uh, over the Iridium satellites. Um, basically, it beacons out four times a day, every six hours, to the satellites, uh, the position, the date and time, and the ship ID to an application service provider. And there's a, uh, a bunch of them. Um, application service provider reports to the flagging country. So the flagging country knows where all of its flagged boats are at any given time. Um, and this is ostensibly an anti-terrorism thing, but I think they're probably just using that as an excuse, as they do. Um, and the application service providers uh, are free to collect the data however they like, um, given the standard. Um, and some of them are on the internet. Um, there's about seven of them that I found on Shodan. Some of them have very interesting names, which I'm not inclined to go to prison to, uh, to dig up, but I'll give you the Shodan links. Um, CMA, GCM, uh, is a big shipping company. Their LRIT fleet tracking services is just online. It's just a HTTP endpoint. Uh, the Vietnamese National Data Center, also online. The Egyptian National Data Center, all, also online. Um, and this is just things that you, you can find on Shodan. Um, also related to LRIT was uh, last year, uh, shout out to XORs, um, who found uh, that the Sailor 9000 um, VSATs, the, uh, the, the satellite communication things, were just exposing all the LRIT data on an unauthenticated website. And he built a ship tracker uh, for Shodan on it, which no longer works. Uh, I'm not sure why. I think he kind of abandoned the project. I'm not sure if he stopped getting the data or something just changed. But ship tracker.shodan was a thing for a while. Um, and you could just track ships that you know maybe they had their, their uh, AIS turned off and didn't want to be tracked. Um, 
once the satellite systems, uh, sorry, once the uh, system was infiltrated, attacker can view call logs on VSAT phones, upload firmware, modify system settings, or just track the ships. So why might we care about tracking ships? Pirates. There are a lot of escort-only waters. So we're talking about, um, for instance, off the, off, uh, off the coast of uh, Somalia. If you, if you want to operate a ship off the coast of Somalia, you, are, uh, you, you bring along an escort, a naval escort. Um, and that's because if a pirate comes in and, and gets on your ship, like, uh, you know, and game over, I guess. Um, so on the other side, if you were a pirate and you wanted to steal the best cargo, I mean, what would you probably do? You'd probably go on to C, uh, CMA or any of the other, Maersk, any of the other ship. Break into their uh, IT systems, find a really juicy manifest, like this one's got Porsches or something. Um, so now you know which ship you're looking for. Um, it's the one that has the nicest manifest. Um, you know, you could probably break into the LRIT system to track the boat, figure out when it's coming close by when it doesn't have uh, an escort, somewhere that you can get to without an escort. Um, or maybe you have a piece of malware that, on a USB stick that you sold them. Uh, when they stopped in Egypt. Um, uh, what if you wanted to, say for instance, redirect the ship? Um, you can use AIS to, to sort of steer it, but that doesn't really work that well. Um, but, you know, you can change around their chart data. Maybe they think that they're going where they're supposed to be, or you've steered them into their escort-only waters without escorts. Um, when the boat's in range, you could attack. Um, but, you know, then they're going to send out a distress signal. What if you take that distress signal and you just put it 100 kilometers away? Um, so the Coast Guard and the Navy is, you know, barreling towards a position which they are no longer at. And, you know, it gives the pirates plenty of time to steal whatever they want. Um, and, you know, steal whatever they're, sink the ship, do whatever they want. Um, nation states is sort of, I find it the less interesting uh, threat model because nation states have near infinite funding. They can do whatever they want. Um, if they're willing to start a war over it, they'll start a war over it. Um, but if they want to be surreptitious and not start a war over it, um, you know, military and commercial vessels off, operate in the same waters. There's only so many ports around. There's only so many cities around. Um, and, you know, similar to the, the Fitzgerald and McCain collisions, um, they can just crash them together. They can lie about the, uh, the, the anti-collision data, um, spoof it, whatever, and cause ships to fall into each other. Um, they might do it, you know, for various reasons, just cause general trading confusion, starve a, com uh, starve a country with, uh, from resources. Maybe they make, maybe it becomes a thing where they start steering ships, you know, uh, slightly away from ports. It costs them extra time and money to get there, just slowly bleed it out. Um, there's a bunch of things that have reserves that you know you need for trade, precious, uh, uh, rare earth metals, and what have you. Maybe they disrupt the the shipping of those. Um, you know, military ships tend to have some form of uh, electronic war countermeasures, uh, but commercial ships do not. There's nothing stopping uh, electronic warfare on on a commercial ship. Um, the navy. Uh, has recently started, bring, because of the GPS abnormalities, the Navy started recently bringing back um, celestial navigation as a thing that they teach in, in naval school. Um, you know, maybe that is an answer. Um, there's also the, the corporate sabotage uh, aspect that we might want to worry about. So if you're a mobster uh, or just otherwise a well-funded attacker um, looking to make some money, uh, maybe you short BP, and then maybe you crash an oil, uh, oil vessel into something, a rock. Uh, pour oil everywhere, BP stock price drops, you make a bunch of money. Like, there's there's a, a fair number of, of different reasons why an attacker might, might go after ships. Um, and what are we going to do about it? Um, is, is the is a much tougher question to answer. Um, maybe we need to get uh, some kind of uh, intrusion detection systems on board, uh, either on the CAN bus or intrusion detection radio systems or something. Um, 
I think that the, the classification societies should probably start focusing a lot on it, having some kind of secure development lifecycle requirements, some kind of uh, uh, certification requirements, um, just to make sure that these systems don't have bugs, such as like the CVEs in the Iridium satellite, where they're just hard-coded credentials. Like any, any ProdSec person, or AppSec, whatever you want to call it, worth their salt um, should trivially have caught that, um, which leads me to believe that they just don't have any. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you want to go from the other aspect, if you want to hack a boat, make sure you do it in international waters in between your monkey knife fights. Um, and other than that, uh, I don't know. I mean, are, I'm open to any questions, suggestions. Please talk to me. Um, you can talk to me afterwards. Uh, and thank you. I'm going to leave my Twitter handle up there. It's probably the easiest way to reach me if you don't want to talk to me in person for whatever reason, because I smell bad. Um, but thank you.